But may this suffice on the saying of Jacob. Let us take another saying, which the Jews did not and cannot twist and distort in this way. In the last words of David, we find him saying, 2 Samuel 23, The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is upon my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken, the Rock of Israel. And a little later, Does not my house stand so with God? Or to translate it literally from the Hebrew, My house is of course not thus, etc. That is to say, My house is, after all, not worthy. This is too glorious a thing, and it is too much that God does all of this for a poor man like me. Quote, For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. Note well how David exults with so numerous and seemingly superfluous words that the Spirit of God has spoken through him, and that God's word is upon his tongue. Thus he says, the God of Israel has spoken, the rock of Israel, etc. It is as if he were to say, My dear people, give ear. Whoever can hear, let him hear. Here is God who is speaking and saying, Listen, etc. What is it, then, that you exhort us to listen to? What is God saying through you? What does he wish to say to you? What shall we hear? This is what you are to hear, that God made an everlasting, firm, and sure covenant with me and my house, a covenant of which my house is not worthy. Indeed, my house is nothing compared to God, and yet he did this. What is the everlasting covenant? Oh, open your ears and listen. My house and God have bound themselves together forever through an oath. This is a covenant, a promise which must exist and endure forever. For it is God's covenant and pledge, which no one shall, shall or can break or hinder. My house shall stand eternally. It is, quote, ordered in all things and secure. The word aruk, ordered, conveys the meaning that it will not disappoint or fail one in the least. Have you heard this? And do you believe that God is faithful? Yes, without doubt. My dear people, do you also believe that he can and will keep his word? Well and good. If God is truthful and almighty and spoke these words through David, which no Jew dares to deny, then David's house and government, which are the same thing, must have endured since the time he spoke those words and must still endure and will endure forever, that is, eternally. Otherwise, God would be a liar. In brief, either we must have David's house or heir, who reigns from the time of David to the present and in eternity, or David died as a flagrant liar to his last day, uttering these words, as it seems, as so much idle chit-chat. God speaks, God says, God promises. It is futile to join the Jews in giving God the lie, saying that he did not keep these precious words and promises. We must, I say, have an heir of David from his time onward, in proof of the fact that his house has never stood empty, no matter where this heir may be. For his house must have been continuous, and must ever remain so. Here we find God's word that this is an everlasting, firm, and sure covenant, without a flaw, but everything in it must be aruk, magnificently ordered, as God orders all his work. Psalm 111, full of honor and majesty in his work. Now let the Jews produce such an heir of David, for they must do so, since we read here that David's house is everlasting a house that no one will destroy or hinder, but rather, as we also read here, it shall be like the sun shining forth, which no cloud can hinder. If they are unable to present such an heir or house, or house of David, then they stand fully condemned by this verse, and they show that they are surely without God, without David, without Messiah, without everything, that they are lost and eternally condemned. Of course, they cannot deny that the kingdom or house of David endured uninterruptedly until the Babylonian captivity, even throughout the Babylonian captivity, and following this to the days of Herod. It endured, I say, 
not by its own power and merit, but by virtue of this everlasting covenant made with the house of David. For most of their kings and rulers were evil, practicing idolatry, killing the prophets, and living shamefully. For example, Rehoboam, Joram, Joash, Ahaz, Manasseh, etc., surpassed all the Gentiles or the kings of Israel in vileness. Because of them, the house and tribe of David fully deserved to be exterminated. That was what finally happened to the kingdom of Israel. However, the covenant made with David remained in effect. The books of the kings and of the prophets exultantly declare that God preserved a lamp or a light to the house of David, which he would not permit to be extinguished. Thus we read in 2 Kings 8 and in 2 Chronicles 21, Yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant which he had made with David, since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. The same thought is expressed in 2 Samuel 7. By way of contrast, look at the kingdom of Israel, where the rule never remained with the same tribe or family beyond the second generation, with the exception of Jehu, who by reason of a special promise carried it into the fourth generation of his house. Otherwise, it always passed from one tribe to another, and at times scarcely survived one generation. Moreover, it was not long until the kingdom died out completely. But through the wondrous deeds of God, the kingdom of Judah remained within the tribe of Judah and the house of David. It withstood strong opposition on the part of the Gentiles round about, from Israel itself, from uprisings within, and from gross idolatries and sins, so that it would not have been surprising if it had perished in the third generation under Rehoboam, or at least under Joram, Ahaz, and Manasseh. But it had a strong protector who did not let it die or let its light become extinguished. The promise was given that it would remain firm, eternally firm and secure. And so it has remained and must remain down to the present and forever. For God does not and cannot lie. The Jews drivel that the kingdom perished with the Babylonian captivity. As we said earlier, this is empty talk, for this constituted but a short punishment, definitely confined to a period of 70 years. God had pledged his word for that. Moreover, he preserved them during this time through splendid prophets. Furthermore, King Jehoiakim was exalted above all the kings in Babylon, and Daniel and his companions ruled not only over Judah and Israel, but also over the Babylonian empire. Even if their seat of government was not in Jerusalem for a short span of time, they nonetheless ruled elsewhere much more gloriously than in Jerusalem. Thus we may say that the house of David did not become extinct in Babylon, but shone more resplendently than in Jerusalem. They only had to vacate their homeland for a while by way of punishment. For when a king takes the field of a foreign country, he cannot be regarded as an ex-king, because he is not in his homeland, especially if he is attended by great victory and good fortune against many nations. Rather, one should say that he is more illustrious abroad than at home. If God kept his covenant from the time of David to that of Herod, preserving his house from extinction, he must have kept it from that time on to the present, and he will keep it eternally, so that David's house has not died and cannot die eternally. For we dare not rebuke God as half truthful and half untruthful, saying that he kept his covenant and preserved David's house faithfully from David's time to that of Herod, but that after the time of Herod he began to lie and to become deceitful, ignoring and altering his covenant. No, for as the house of David remained and shone up to Herod's time, thus it had to remain under Herod and after Herod, shining to eternity. Now, we note how nicely this saying of David harmonizes with that of the patriarch Jacob. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the Mehokek from his feet, until Messiah comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. How can it be expressed more clearly or differently that David's house will shine forth until the Messiah comes? Then through him... The house of David will shine not only over Judah and Israel, but also over all the Gentiles, or over other and more numerous countries. 
This indeed does not mean that it will become extinct, but that it will shine farther and more lustrously than before his advent. And thus, as David says, this is an eternal kingdom and an eternal co covenant. Therefore, it follows most cogently from this that the Messiah came when the scepter departed from Judah, unless we want to revile God by saying he did not keep his covenant and oath. Even if the stiff-necked, stubborn Jews refuse to accept this, at least our faith has been confirmed and strengthened by it. We do not give a fig for their crazy glosses, which they have spun out of their own heads. We have the clear text. These last words of David, to revert to them once more, are founded on God's own word, where he says to him, as he here boasts at his end, Would you build me a house to dwell in? 2 Samuel 7. You can read what follows there, how God continues to relate that until now he has lived in no house, but that he had chosen him to be a prince over his people, to whom he would assign a fixed place and grant him rest, concluding, I will make you a house. That is to say, neither you nor anyone else will build a house to dwell in. For me, I am far, far too great for that, as we read also in Isaiah 66. No, I will build you a house. For thus says the Lord, as Nathan asserts, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Everyone is familiar with a house built by man, a very perishable structure fashioned of stone and wood. But a house built by God means the establishing of the father of a family who would ever after have heirs and descendants of his blood and lineage. Thus Moses says in Exodus 1 that God built houses for the midwives because they did not obey the king's command, but let the infants live and did not kill them. On the other hand, he breaks down and extinguishes the houses of the kings of Israel in the second generation. Thus David has here a secure house, built by God, which is to have heirs forever. It is not a plain house. No, he says, you shall be prince over my people Israel. Therefore, it shall be called a princely, a royal house. That is the house of Prince David, or King David, in which your children shall reign forever and be princes such as you are. The books and histories of the kings prove this true, tracing it down to the time of Herod. Until that time, the scepter and Safra are in the tribe of Judah. Now follows the second theme concerning Shiloh. How long shall my house thus stand, and how long shall my descendants rule? He answers thus, When your days are fulfilled, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, utero, that is, from your flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. When he commits iniquity, I will chastise him with the rod of men, as one whips children, with the stripes of the sons of men. But I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This statement is found almost verbatim also in First Chronicles 18, where you may read it. Whoever would refer these verses to Solomon would indeed be an arbitrary interpreter, for although Solomon was not yet born at this time, indeed the adultery with his mother Bathsheba had not yet even been committed, he is nonetheless not the seed of David born after David's death, of whom the text says, when your days are fulfilled, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your seed after you. For Solomon was born during David's lifetime. It would be foolish, yes ridiculous, to say that the term raised up here means that Solomon should be raised up after David's death to become king or to build the house. For three other chapters, 1 Kings 1, 1 Chronicles 24, and 1 Chronicles 29, attest that Solomon was not only instated as king during his father's lifetime, but that he also received command from his father David, as well as the entire plan of the temple, of all the rooms, its detailed equipment, 
and the organization of the whole kingdom. It is obvious that Solomon did not build the temple or order the kingdom or the priesthood according to his own plans, but according to those of David, who prescribed everything, in fact, already arranged it during his lifetime. There is also a great discrepancy and a difference in words between 2 Samuel 7 and 1 Chronicles 24 and 29. The former states that God will build David an eternal house, the latter that Solomon shall build a house in God's name. The former passage states without any condition or qualification that it shall stand forever and be hindered by no sin. The latter passage conditions its continuance on Solomon's and his descendants' continued piety. Since he did not remain pious, he not only lost the ten tribes of Israel, but was also exterminated in the seventh generation. The former is a promissio gratiae, a promise of grace. The latter, a promissio legis, a promise of law. In the former passage, David thanks God that his house will stand forever. In the latter, he does not thank God that Solomon's temple will stand forever. In other words, the two passages refer to different times and to different things and houses. And although God does call Solomon his son, in the latter also, and says that he will be his father, the promise is dependent on that condition that Solomon will remain pious. Such a condition is not found in the former passage. It is not at all rare that God calls his saints, as well as his angels, his children. But the son mentioned in 2 Samuel 7 is a different and special son who will retain the kingdom unconditionally and be hindered by no sin. And the prophets and the Psalms quote 2 Samuel 7, which speaks of David's seed after his death, whereas they pay no attention to 1 Chronicles 24 and 29, which speak of Solomon. In Psalm 89, we read, I will sing of thy steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim thy faithfulness to all generations, for thy steadfast love was established forever. Thy, thy faithfulness is firm as the heavens. Thou hast said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. These two are clear words. God vows and swears an oath to grant David his grace forever and to build and preserve his house, seed, and throne eternally. Later, in verse 19, we have an express reference to the true David. This verse contains the most beautiful prophecies of the Messiah, which cannot apply to Solomon. For he was not the sovereign of all kings on earth, nor did his rule extend over land and sea. These facts cannot be glossed over. Furthermore, the kingdom did not remain with Solomon's house. He had no absolute promise with regard to this, but only a promise conditional on his piety. But it was the house of David that had the promise, and he had more sons than Solomon. And as the history books report, the scepter of Judah at times passed from brother to brother, from cousin to cousin, but always remained in the house of David. For instance, Ahaziah's left no son, and Ahaz left none. So, according to the custom of Holy Scripture, the nephews had to be heirs and sons. Anyone who would venture to contradict such clear and convincing statements of Scripture regarding the eternal house of David, which are borne out by the histories, showing that there were always kings or princes down to the Messiah, must either be the devil himself or whoever is his follower. For I can readily believe that the devil, or whoever it may be, would be unwilling to acknowledge a Messiah, but still he would have to acknowledge David's eternal house and throne. For he cannot deny the clear words of God in his oath, vowing that his word would not be changed and that he would not lie to David, not even by reason of any sin, as the aforementioned psalm impressively and clearly states. Now, such an eternal house of David is nowhere to be found unless we place the scepter before the Messiah and the Messiah after the scepter, and then join the two together, namely by asserting that the Messiah appeared when the scepter departed 
and that David's house was thus preserved forever. In that way, God is found truthful and faithful in his word, covenant, and oath. For it is obvious that the scepter of Judah completely collapsed at the time of Herod, but much more so when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the scepter of Judah. Now, if David's house is eternal and God truthful, then the true king of Judah, the Messiah, must have come at that time. No barking, no interpreting or glossing will change this. The text is too authoritative and all too clear. If the Jews refuse to admit it, we do not care. For us, it is enough that, first of all, our Christian faith finds here most substantial proof, and that such verses afford me very great joy and comfort that we have such strong testimony also in the Old Testament. Second, we are certain that even the devil and the Jews themselves cannot refute this in their hearts, and that in their own consciences they are convinced of David. This can surely and certainly be noted by the fact that they twist this saying of Jacob concerning the scepter, as they do all of Scripture, in so many ways betraying that they are convinced and won over, and yet refuse to admit it. They are like the devil, who knows very well that God's word is the truth, and yet with deliberate malice contradicts and blasphemes it. The Jews feel distinctly that these verses are solid rock, and their interpretation nothing but straw or spider web. But with willful and malicious resolve, they will not admit this, yet they insist on being and on being known as God's people, solely because they are of the blood of the patriarchs. Otherwise, they have nothing of which to boast. As to what lineage alone can affect, we have spoken above. It is just as if the devil were to boast that he was of angelic stock, and by reason of this was the only angel and child of God, even though he is really God's foe. Now that we have considered these verses, let us hear what Jeremiah says. Jeremiah's words sound very strange, for we know that he was a prophet long after the kingdom of Israel had been destroyed and exiled, when only the kingdom of Judah still existed, which itself was soon to go into captivity in Babylon as he foretold to them, and even experienced during his lifetime. Yet, despite this, he dares to say in chapter 33, For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, and to burn cereal offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant with the day, and my covenant with the night, so that day and night will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne, and my covenant with the Levitical priests, my ministers. The word of God came to Jeremiah. Have you not observed what these people are saying? The Lord has rejected the two families which he chose. Thus they have despised my people, so that they are no longer a nation in their sight. Thus says the Lord, If I have established my covenant with day and night, and the ordinances of heaven and earth, then I will reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his descendants to rule over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will restore their fortunes, and will have mercy upon them. Now what can we say to this? Whoever can interpret it, let him do so. Here we read that not only David, but also the Levites will endure forever, and the same for Israel, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is emphasized that David will have a son who will sit on his throne eternally, just as surely as day and night continue forever. On the other hand, we hear that Israel will be led away into captivity, and also Judah after her, but that Israel will not be brought home again as Judah will be. Tell me, how does all this fit together? God's word cannot lie, just as God watches over the course of the heavens, so that day and night follow an endless succession, so too David, that is, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, must have a son on his throne uninterruptedly. 
God himself draws this comparison. It is impossible for the Jews to make sense of it, for they see with their very eyes that neither Israel nor Judah has had a government for nearly 1,500 years. In fact, Israel has not had one for 2,000 years. Yet God must be truthful, do what we will. The kingdom of David must rule over the seed of Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, as Jeremiah states here, or Jeremiah is not a prophet, but a liar. We shall let the Jews reconcile and interpret this as they will or can. For us, the passage leaves no doubt. It affirms that David's house will endure forever. Also the Levites and Abraham's, Isaac's, and Jacob's seed under the son of David. As long as day and night, or as it is otherwise expressed, as long as the sun and moon endure. If this is true, then the Messiah must have come when David's house and rule ceased to exist. Thus, David's throne assumed more splendor through the Messiah, as we read in Isaiah 9. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Pele, Joetz, El Gibor, Abigad, Sahar Shalom. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. We may revert to this later, but here we shall refrain from discussing how the blind Jews twist these six names of the Messiah. They accept this verse and admit, as they must admit, that it speaks of the Messiah. We quote it because Jeremiah states that David's home will rule forever. David's house rather, will rule forever, first through the scepter up to the time of the Messiah, and after that much more glorious through the Messiah. So it must be true that David's house has not ceased up to this hour, and that it will not cease to eternity. But since the scepter of Judah departed 1,500 years ago, the Messiah must have come that long ago, or, as we have said above, 1,468 years ago. All of this is convincingly established by Prophet Jeremiah. However, some among us may wonder how it is possible that at the time of Jeremiah, and then up to the advent of the Messiah, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob existed and remained under the tribe of Judah or the throne of David, even though only Judah remained whereas Israel was exiled. These persons must be informed that the kingdom of Israel was led into captivity and destroyed, that it never returned home and never will return home, but that Israel, or the seed of Israel, always continued to a certain extent under Judah, and that it was exiled with Judah and returned again with her. You may read about this in 1 Samuel, 1 Kings 10 and 12, and 2 Chronicles 30 and 31. Here you will learn that the entire tribe of Benjamin, thus a good part of Israel, remained with Judah, as well as the whole tribe of Levi, together with many members of the tribes of Ephraim, Manasseh, Asher, Issachar, and Zebulun, who remained in the country after the destruction of the kingdom of Israel, and who held to Hezekiah in Jerusalem, and helped to purge the land of Israel of idols. Furthermore, many Israelites dwelt in the cities of Judah. Since we find so many Israelites living under the rule of the son of David, Jeremiah is not lying when he says that the Levites and the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be found under the rule of David's house. All of these, or at least a number of them, were taken to Babylon and returned from it with Judah, as Ezra enumerates and recounts. Undoubtedly, many more returned of those who were led away under Sennacherib, since the Assyrian or Median kingdom was brought under the Persian rule through Cyrus, so that Judah and Israel were very likely able to join and return together from Babylon to Jerusalem and to the land of Canaan. For I know for certain that we find these words in Ezra 2. And all Israel or all who were there from Israel, lived in their towns. And how could they live there if they had not come back? 
In the days of Herod and of the Messiah, the land was again full of Israelites. For in the seventy weeks of Daniel, that is in four hundred and ninety years, they had assembled again. However, they did not again establish a kingdom. Therefore, the present-day Jews are very ignorant teachers and indolent pupils of Scripture when they allege that Israel has not yet returned, as though all of Israel would have to return. Actually, not all of Judah returned either, but only a small number, as we gather from Ezra's enumeration. The majority of them remained in Babylon, as did Daniel, Nehemiah, and Mordecai themselves. Similarly, the majority of the Israelites remained in Medea, uh, in Media, though they perhaps traveled to Jerusalem for the high festivals and then returned to their homes again, as Luke writes in the Acts of the Apostles. God never promised that the kingdom or scepter of Israel would be restored like that of Judah, but he did promise this to Judah. The latter also had to recover it by virtue of God's promise that he would establish David's house and throne forever and not let it die out. For as Jeremiah declares here, God will not tolerate that anyone slander him by saying that he had rejected Judah and Israel entirely, so that they should no longer be his people, and that David's throne should come to an end, as if he had forgotten his promise, when he had promised and pledged to David an eternal house. Even though they would now have to be sojourning in Babylon for a little while, still, he says, it will remain an eternal house and kingdom. I am saying this to honor and to strengthen our faith and to shame the hardened unbelief of the blinded and stubborn Jews, for whom God must ever and eternally be a liar, as though he had let David's house die out and forgotten his covenant and his oath sworn to David. For if they would admit that God is truthful, they would have to confess that the Messiah came 1,500 years ago, so that David's house and throne should not be desolate for so long, as they suppose, just because Jerusalem has lain in ashes and has been devoid of David's throne and house so long. For if God kept his promise from the time of David to the Babylonian captivity, and from then to the days of Herod, and then the scepter departed, he must also have kept it subsequently and forever after, or else David's house is not an eternal but a perishable house, which has ceased together with the scepter at the time of Herod. But, as we have already said, God will not tolerate this. No, David's house will be everlasting, like day and night and the ordinances of heaven and earth, as Jeremiah puts it. However, since the scepter of Judah was lost at the time of Herod, it cannot be eternal unless the son of David, the Messiah, has come, seated himself on David's throne, and become Lord of the world. If the Jews are correct, then David's house must have been extinct for 1,568 years, contrary to God's promise and oath. This is impossible to believe. Now, this is a thorough exposition of the matter, and no Jew can adduce anything to refute it. Outwardly, he may pretend that he does not believe it, but his heart and his conscience are devoid of anything to contradict it. And how could God have maintained the honor of his divine truthfulness, having promised to David an eternal house and throne, if he then let it stand desolate longer than intact? Let us figure this out. In the opinion of the Jews, the time from David to Herod covers not quite a thousand years. So David's house or throne stood for that length of time, inclusive of the 70 years spent in Babylon. We would add over 100 years to this total. From Herod's time, or rather let us say, for this is, this is not far from correct, from the destruction of Jerusalem, to the year 1542, there are 1,568 years, as stated above. According to this computation, David's house and throne have been empty four or five hundred years longer than it was occupied. Now, inquire of stone and log whether such may be called an eternal house, especially constructed by God and preserved by his sublime faithfulness and truthfulness, a house that stands for one thousand years and lies in ashes for fourteen or fifteen hundred years.
Though the Jews be as hard or harder than a diamond, the lightning and thunder of such clear and manifest truth should smash or at least soften them. But as I said before, our faith is cheered thereby, it is strengthened, it is made sure and certain that we do have the true Messiah, who surely came and appeared at the time when Herod took away the scepter of Judah and the Safra, so that David's house might be eternal and forever have a son upon his throne, as God said and swore to him and made a covenant with him. Now some crafty Jew might try to cast up to me my book against the Sabbatarians, in which I demonstrated that the word eternally, le olam, often means not really an eternity, but merely, quote-unquote, a long time. Thus Moses says in Exodus 21 that the master shall take the slave who wants to stay with him and bore through his ear with an awl on the door, quote, and he shall serve him eternally. Here the word designates a human eternity, that is, a lifetime. But I also said in the same treaty that when God uses the word eternal, it is a truly divine eternity. And he commonly adds another phrase to the effect that it shall not be otherwise, as in Psalm 110. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Similarly, in Psalm 132, the Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back, etc. Wherever such a not is added, this means surely eternal and not otherwise. Thus we read in Isaiah, of peace there will be no end. And in Daniel, his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is eternal, not before men who do not live eternally, but before God who lives eternally. The promise states that David's house and throne shall be eternal before God. He says, Before me, before me, a son shall forever sit upon your throne. In Psalm 89, he also adds the little word, not. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His line shall endure forever. His throne, as long as the sun before me. Like the moon, it shall be established forever. It shall stand firm while the skies endure. The last words of David convey the same thought. Quote, he has made me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. These words, ordered and secure, mean the same as firm, sure, eternal, never failing. The same applies to the saying of Jacob in Genesis 49. The scepter shall not depart. Not depart signifies eternally, until the Messiah comes. And that surely means eternally. For all the prophets assigned to the Messiah an eternal kingdom, a kingdom without end. But if we assume that this refers to a human or temporal eternity or an indefinite period of time, which is impossible, then the meaning would necessarily be as follows. Your house shall be eternal before me, that is, your house shall stand as long as it stands, or for your lifetime. This would pledge and promise David the equivalent, the equivalent of exactly nothing, for even in the absence of such an oath, David's house would stand, quote-unquote, eternally, that is, as long as it stands, or as long as he lives. But let us dismiss such nonsense from our minds, which would occur to none but a blinded rabbi. When Scripture glories in the fact that God did not want to destroy Judah because of the sins committed under Rehoboam, but that a lamp should remain to David, as God has promised him regarding his house, 2 Kings 8.19, it shows that all understood the word eternal in its true sense. Someone might also cite here the instance of the Maccabees. After Antiochus the noble had ruthlessly savaged or ravaged the people and the country so that the princes of the house of David became extinct, the Maccabees ruled, who were not of the house of David but of the tribe of the priests, which meant that the scepter had departed from Judah and that a son of David did not sit eternally on the throne of David. Thus, the eternal house of David could not be really eternal, 
We reply, the Jews cannot disturb us with this argument, and we need not answer them, for none of this is found in Scripture, because Malachi is the last prophet, and Nehemiah the last historian, who, as we can gather from his book, lived until the time of Alexander. Therefore, both parties must rely, so far as this question is concerned, on Jeremiah's statement that a son of David was to occupy his throne or rule forever. For apart from Scripture, whoever wants to concern himself with this may regard it as an open question whether the Maccabees themselves ruled or whether they served the rulers. As to the reliability of the historians, we shall have some comments later on. It seems to me, however, that the following incident recorded in Scripture should not be treated lightly. At the time of Queen Athaliah, for fully six years, no son of David occupied his throne. She, Athaliah, the tyrant, reigned alone. She had all the male descendants of David slain, with the single exception of J Joash, an infant a quarter or a half year old, who had been secretly removed, hidden in the temple, and reared by the excellent Jehosheba, the wife of the high priest Jehoiada, daughter of King Joram, and sister of King Ahaziah, whom Jehu slew. Here the eternal covenant of God made with David was in great peril indeed, resting on one young lad in hiding, who was far from occupying the throne of David. At this time his house resembled a dark lantern in which the light is extinguished, since a foreign queen, a Gentile from Sidon, was sitting and reigning on David's throne. However, she burned her ass thoroughly on that throne. Still, all this did not mean that the scepter had departed or that God's eternal covenant was broken. For even if the light... It was still glimmering in that child Joash, who would again shine brightly in the future and rule. He was already born as a son of David, and these six years were nothing but a tentatio, a temptation. God often gives the appearance that he is unmindful of his word and is failing us. This he did with Abraham when he commanded him to burn to ashes his dear son Isaac, in whom, after all, God's promise of the eternal seed was embodied. Likewise, when he led the children of Israel from Egypt. In fact, he seemed to be leading them into death. With the sea before them, high cliffs on both sides, and the enemy at their back blocking their way of escape. But matters proceeded according to God's word and promises. The sea had to open, move, and make way for them. If the sea had not done this, then the cliffs would have had to split asunder and make a path for them, and they would have squeezed and squashed Pharaoh between them, just as the, the sea drowned the foe. For all creatures would rather have to perish a thousand thousand times than that God's word should fail and deceive, however strange things may appear. Thus Joash is king through and in God's word, and occupies the throne of David before God, although he still lies in the cradle, yes, even if he lay dead and buried under the ground, for in spite of all, he would have to rise like Isaac from the ashes. In such a manner, we might also account for the story of the Maccabees, but this is unnecessary, for it has an entirely different meaning. The Babylonian captivity might be viewed similarly. However, thanks to splendid prophets and miracles, the situation at that time was much brighter. But Joash posed a terrible temptation for the house of David, against the covenant and the oath of God. Although the house and rule of David still flourished, it was only the ruler, or the head, that was suffering and that faltered in God's covenant. But this is the manner of his divine grace, that he sometimes plays and jokes with his own. He hides himself and disguises himself so that he may test us to see whether we will remain firm in faith and love towards him, just as a father sometimes does with his children. Such jesting of our Heavenly Father pains us immeasurably, since we do not understand it. However, this is out of place here. We have been speaking about a statement of Jeremiah. We will now turn our attention to one of the last prophets. In Haggai, we read, For thus says the Lord of hosts, once again, in a little while,
I will shake heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, so that the consolation or desire of the Gentiles, all nations, Kimdath, Chimdath, shall come, and I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The splendor of this latter house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. This is another of those passages which pains the Jews intensely. They test it, twist it, interpret and distort almost every word, just as they do the statement of Jacob in Genesis 49. But it does not help them. Their conscience pales before this passage. It senses that their glosses are null and void. Lyra does well when he plies them hard with the phrase adhuk modicum, in a little while. They cannot elude him, as we shall see. In a little while, he says, cannot possibly mean a long period of time. Lyra is surely right here. No one can deny it. Not even a Jew. Try as hard as he may. In a little while, he says, the consolation of the Gentiles will come after this temple is built. That is, he will come when this temple is still standing. And the splendor of this latter temple will be greater than that of the former. And this will happen shortly, i.e., in a little while. For it is easily understood that if the consolation of the Gentiles, whom the ancients interpret as the Messiah, did not come while that temple was still standing, but is still to come, the Jews have been waiting for 1,568 years, already since the destruction of the temple. And this cannot be termed a little while, especially since they cannot foresee the end of this long term. Then he will never come, for he neglected to come in this little short time, and now has entered upon the great long time, which will never result in anything. For the prophet speaks of a short, not a long time. But, they extricate themselves from this difficulty as follows. Since they cannot ignore the words in a little while, they take up and crucify the expression consolation of the Gentiles. In Hebrew, chimdath, just as they did earlier with the words shebet and shiloh in the saying of Jacob. They insist that this term does not refer to the Messiah, but that it designates the gold and silver of all the Gentiles. Grammatically, the word chemdath really means desire or pleasure. Thus, it would mean that the Gentiles have a desire for or take pleasure and delight in something. So, the text must read thus. In a short time, the desire of all the Gentiles will appear. And what does this mean? What do the Gentiles desire? I'm sorry. What do the Gentiles desire? Gold, silver, and gems. You may ask why the Jews make this kind of gloss here. I will tell you. Their breath stinks with lust for the Gentiles' gold and silver. For no nation under the sun is greedier than they were, still are, and always will be, as is evident from their accursed usury. So they comfort themselves that when the Messiah comes, he will take, he will take the gold, I'm sorry, he will take the gold and silver of the whole wor world away from the Gentiles and divide it among them. Therefore, wherever they can quote scripture to satisfy their insatiable greed and avarice, they do so outrageously. One is led to believe that God and his prophets knew of nothing else to prophesy than of ways and means to satisfy the bottomless greed of the accursed Jews with the Gentiles' gold and silver. However, the prophet has not chosen his words properly to accord with this greedy understanding. He should have said, In a little while the desire of the Jews shall come. For the Jews are the ones who desire gold and silver, more avidly than any other nation on earth. In view of that, the text should more properly speak of the desire of the Jews than of the Gentiles. For although the Gentiles do desire gold and silver, 
Nevertheless, here are the Jews who desire and covet this desire of the Gentiles, who desire that it be brought to them, so that they may devour it and leave nothing for the Gentiles. Why? Because they are the noble blood, the circumcised saints, who have God's commandments, and do not keep them, but are stiff-necked, disobedient, prophet murderers, arrogant, usurers, and filled with every vice, as the whole of Scripture and their present conduct bear out. Such saints, of course, are properly entitled to the Gentiles' gold and silver. They honestly and honorably desire it for such behavior, just as the devil deserves paradise and heaven. Further, how does it happen that such very intelligent and wise holy prophets do not also apply the word desire, chimdath, to all the other desires of the Gentiles? For the Gentiles desire not only gold and silver, but also pretty girls, and the women desire handsome young men. Wherever we find among the Gentiles anything other than Jews, I almost said misers, who will not bestow any good on their bodies, they desire also beautiful houses, gardens, cattle, and property, as well as good times, clothes, food, drink, dancing, playing, and all sorts of enjoyment. Why, then, do the Jews not interpret this verse of the prophet to mean that such desires of all the Gentiles also will shortly come to Jerusalem, so that the Jews alone might fill their bellies and feast on the world's joys? For such a mode of life, Muhammad promises his Saracens. In that respect, he is a genuine Jew, and the Jews are genuine Saracens, according to this interpretation. The Gentiles have another desire. How could these wise, clever interpreters overlook it? I am surprised at it. The Gentiles die, and they are afflicted with much sickness, poverty, and all kinds of distress and fear. There is not one of them who does not most ardently wish that he did not have to die, that he could avoid need misery and sickness, or be quickly freed from them, and secure against them. This desire is so pronounced that they would gladly surrender all others for its fulfillment, as experience shows do daily. Why then do the Jews not explain that such desire of all the Gentiles will also come to the temple in Jerusalem in a little while? Jews, shame on you here, that there, or wherever you may be, you damned Jews, that you dare to apply this earnest, glorious, comforting word of God so despicably to your mortal, greedy belly, which is doomed to decay, and that you are not ashamed to display your greed so openly. You are not worthy of looking at the outside of the Bible, much less of reading it. You should read only the Bible that is found under the sow's tail, and eat and drink the letters that drop from there. That would be a Bible for such prophets, who root about like sows and tear apart like pigs the words of the divine majesty, which should be heard with all honor, awe, and joy. Furthermore, when the prophet says that, quote, the splendor of this latter house shall be greater than the former, let us listen to the noble and filthy, I meant to say circumcised, saints, and wise prophets, who want to make Jews of us Christians. The greater splendor of the latter temple, compared to the former, consists, they say, in this, that it, that is the temple of Haggai, stood ten years longer than the temple of Solomon, etc. Alas, if they had only had a good astronomer, who could have worked out the time a little more precisely, perhaps he would have found the difference between the two to be three months, two weeks, five days, seven hours, twelve minutes, and ten half minutes over and above the ten years. If there were a store anywhere that offered blushes for sale, I might give the Jews a few florins to go and buy a pound of flushes to smear over their forehead, eyes, and cheeks, if they would refuse to cover their impudent heart and tongue with them. Or do these ignorant, stupid asses suppose that they are talking to sticks and blocks, like themselves. There were many old gray men and women, very likely also beggars and villains, in Jerusalem, when Solomon, a young man of twenty years, became a glorious king, 
Should these, for that reason, be more glorious than Solomon? Perhaps David's mule, on which Solomon became king, was older than Solomon. Should he, by reason of that, be greater than Solomon? But thus those will bump their heads, stumble, and fall, who incessantly give God the lie and claim that they are in the right. They deserve no better fate than to compose such glosses on the Bible, such foolishness and ignominy. This they indeed do most diligently. Therefore, dear Christian, be on your guard against the Jews, who, as you discover here, are consigned by the wrath of God to the devil, who has not only robbed them of a proper understanding of Scripture, but also of ordinary human reason, shame, and sense, and only works mischief with Holy Scripture through them. Therefore they cannot be trusted and believed in any other matter either, even though a truthful word may drop from their lips occasionally. For anyone who dares to juggle the awesome word of God so frivolously and shamefully, as you see it done here, and as you also noted earlier with regard to the words of Jacob, cannot have a good spirit dwelling in him. Therefore, wherever you see a genuine Jew, you may with a good conscience cross yourself and bluntly say, There goes a devil incarnate.